Good, good afternoon, I'm Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's final fall seminar. We'll be hosting additional seminars in the spring, and we hope you will join us for those as well. Information will become available very soon for those, for those seminars on our website. We have multiple sites around the state joining us this afternoon. Head, though. Joining us this afternoon is all the sites have previously tested con connections. We don't expect any issues, but should you need assistance, please utilize your technical support at your site. Also, please, please be sure that your microphones are muted. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions this afternoon, and we welcome any questions from all our sites. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. I also want to remind everyone that you need to sign in at your location, and please take a moment at the conclusion of the seminar to complete our brief evaluation it is really helpful as we plan for upcoming seminars. Now I'm going to turn things over to Katie, Wolf, Whaley, and Jeff White. Good afternoon. Yay! <laughs> what a way to start having to talk on a Friday afternoon. Um, this afternoon we're going to present on the idea of employment first. Um, and then it really is more than just a slogan. I think we hear that, at least we in the employment side and in other services side, hear that a whole lot um, these days. So we're going to talk about what it means and what it can mean here in Kentucky. The, uh, my part of the presentation is talking about the road to employment first. And that's a road that we've been on in Kentucky now for going on about two and a half, three years. Um, the best definition that I've been able to find of Employment First comes from APSI, the Association for Persons Supporting Employment First. And that definition simply is that employment in the general workforce is the first and preferred outcome for the provision of publicly funded services for all working age citizens with disabilities regardless of the level of disability. So there is an expectation that everyone has the ability to work and that's what Employment First is built upon. Um, as I said, we've been on the road to employment first for between two and three years, and we're in good company. Uh, there are active employment first efforts going on now in at least 44 states. Uh, in Kentucky, we are at the very verge of perhaps uh, having an official policy in place. We have been notified by the governor's office that there is interest in either legislation or an executive order coming up as soon as this year, uh, this upcoming year. Um, be sure to know that Governor Bashir is very much a supporter. The question is whether this will really fit into the plans for the last few months of his administration or not. So let's talk about what we have to believe in order for employment first to have validity. First of all, we believe that nearly all people with disabilities can contribute to the community uh, and in the valued social roles that they desire, given the appropriate amount of support. Uh, it's just a given to us that everyone has a role to play. Um, <coughs> we have to be committed to make sure that the folks in our programs have the level of support that's needed for them to be successful. And the two key points are that we need to provide the amount of support that is needed. To provide less than is needed is unacceptable, but by the same token, to provide more support than is needed is disrespectful. So we need to give folks the tools to be successful. We do not need to uh, uh, push beyond the ability and the desire that they have. So Employment First in Kentucky we spent a fair amount of time uh, coming up with a statement. And in Kentucky, we do things a little differently. So in Kentucky, we're actually working on employment and education first. And our statement is that for persons with disabilities receiving assistance from publicly funded systems who wish to work or further their education at a college or university to improve their options for work, then employment in the general workforce in typical work settings working side by side with people without disabilities, earning regular wages and benefits and being part of the economic mainstream of our society should be the first and preferred option. Uh, in, gen in the one basic statement we can make is that employment and education first really means real jobs 
for real wages. Okay? So that is the statement that we have agreed upon that we're beginning to work on. Uh, in order for Employment First to happen, a lot of different changes have had to occur. We have had changes in public policy, changes in innovation and practice, and changes in expectations. Some of the public, public policy changes we've seen, perhaps the, well, not perhaps, the most important legislation for people with disabilities, the Americans with Disabilities Act back in 1990. Uh, when that act was passed, I actually worked in Virginia in the, in the uh, outskirts of Washington, D.C., and was able to be slightly involved in that process. And it was so interesting to see the collaboration between really the government, government society, government option, offices, the agencies that were involved, and business. Business was ready for the Americans with Disabilities Act to happen. Follow that with the Americans with the IDEA, uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that has set the stage for our transition efforts. Ticket to Work, uh, Workforce Investment Act, Olmstead, uh, changes, recent changes, not recent, the actual old changes in, in the RSA regulations uh, that required that employment outcomes have to be in integrated settings. Uh, CMS suggestions on waiver service uh, definitions. Recently, executive orders and, and new employment requirements for federal contractors. CMS's final rule on, on home and community-based services. Many of you are aware that we're preparing a, a, a transition plan uh, to go into effect. And uh, WIOA in, uh, earlier this year. Um, so a great deal has happened. More is happening. Uh, something really interesting happened, happened this past Wednesday. We'll talk a little bit later, called the ABLE Act. It's the beginnings of movement toward a, a really new and innovative and fantastic opportunity. Innovations in practice. Well, you know, we had a, a pretty strong movement from medical models to social models, particularly through waiver programming. Uh, we began to see things funded like supported employment and other things that are not traditionally a medical, medical offering. In 1980s, the emergency of, emergence of support employment in Kentucky was a leader in support employment back in the 80s. Many of you remember Carol Estes and uh, some of some of the other folks that worked for VR, they, many, many great things happened with support employment in Kentucky. Then waivers became available, and guess what? There was less difficult money to support folks, to be honest. Day programming provided an opportunity for folks to do something during the day that was less staff involved, and, uh, and, and that grew at a tremendous rate. rate. Uh, as we began looking at work in general, uh, we were in a situation of train in place where folks would go into a, a facility and they would be trained for a time and eventually they may or may not go out into the workforce. And that began to move back to place and train, which is how the general population tends to learn, learn, learn jobs. Uh, 1980s, we began to see the expanded use of what we call natural supports now, uh, where folks get support on the job in the same means that other employees get support on the job. Uh, mental health opportunities, employment as part of recovery. In Kentucky, the development of the Dartmouth model, I guess we're calling the IPS now, individual planning and, and support. Uh, it's tremendous, tremendous success and it's been expanded now throughout all 14 CMHC areas. Uh, innovation and technology has made a tremendous difference. Uh, transition practices, uh, the whole aspect of self-determination has, has really <coughs> begun to move things for, forward. Uh, changes in the workplace, uh, allowing more flexibility, diversity, and universal design. So all these things have kind of changed together to create a wonderful environment for employment. Changes in expectations. When I was growing up, um, very few people with disabilities really had an expectation that they would work in the community. Their families had no expectation typically that they would work in the communities. I had a first cousin who was deaf and had, at that time we called it mental retardation, now we call it intellectual disabilities. We had no expectation that she would work in the community. Wow, were we ever wrong? 
Uh, you know, she worked for a span of time in a sheltered workshop until that workshop closed. Then she began to work in the factory for the contractor for whom she was doing work in the sheltered workshop. Uh, so I mean, it's just tremendous, tremendous changes. Disability is no longer seen as insur an insurmountable barrier to employment. Folks with disabilities can and do work in every facet of our community. Uh, so our expectations are changing across the board with families, public policy, society, everything. So we have a perfect situation now to begin moving forward with employment first. So as I told you, we're, we're on the verge of heading for, formally down that road, but really having an employment first law or an employment first executive order means very little if you don't have the structure in place for it to have meaning. So we've been working for several years now at trying to define what Employment First will look like in Kentucky. So our areas of emphasis are asset management, economic self-sufficiency being acknowledged as a priority in policies and procedures. Any of you who have been involved with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation lately understands that there is a tremendous movement toward asset development being led by OVR. Uh, and we ha now have a situation where folks are beginning to develop a financial identity. And, and that is so important in today's world as you move forward. So that, moving that forward for our folks is a huge priority. Uh, we want to make sure that there are people at the local and regional level who, level who are responsible for managing the development of employment services. We've been working very closely with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and the supported employment counselors uh, and are beginning to do some work together directly with providers in the, the area of utilization management, utilization review, and beginning to do some cross-training so that we can, again, uh, work even more closely together and so the providers will know there are folks out there that they can contact for assistance with employment. Rates and rate structures. Most of you who have been involved in waiver services understand that we have had a change in rates for the SCL waiver. The disappointing fact is that we have not had a change in rate structure for the Michelle P waiver. Um, in reality, the previous rate, the current Michelle P rate, does not allow providers, in my opinion at least, to provide supported employment at a rate that will cover their expenses. So any provider who is providing supported employment to folks on Michelle P is doing so by subsidizing that activity from the funds that they receive from other activities. Uh, that is a situation that we hope very much will change in the near future. Uh, we're in the final month of implementation of SCL2, so the SCL rate at the end of December will have doubled, essentially, for every person receiving supported employment. It is our sincere hope that that same thing will happen with Michelle P. very soon, uh, because uh, providers need to at least be able to cover their costs, and the SCL2 rate essentially is designed to do that. Uh, all appropriate person folks need to be educated about employment. Uh, and we began with the help of APSI uh, down that road this year with the Take Your Legislator to Work activity. Uh, wasn't as well attended as we would have liked to have seen. But again, our legislators, our executive staff, and our administrators need to know about employment and what employment should look like just as much as our staff who are providing employment supports, okay? It's a huge, uh, the changes we have made in employment services are, are really a rather huge undertaking. And we have got to be able to provide adequate technical assistance and training to folks who are out there doing the hard work. And I will tell you that in my humble opinion, no one does it better than the Human Development Institute here at, uh, at UK. We have folks coming from many other states to receive support employment training from, from our folks here. And we, couldn't be, we really couldn't be more proud of the product that they make available to folks. 
we need to continue that but we need to also reach out to, to the staff members and the with the uh, bodies that are administering the funds and other staff within the agencies that are providing support so that everyone has an accurate understanding of what employment services need to look like in Kentucky we need to have data collected and uh, used to inform our strategies right now we do not uh, we have made some efforts in that direction uh, but we need to step back and try and revise those efforts uh, right now we really have no idea how many folks are actually working across the board and supported employment in Kentucky we've tried to estimate we've tried to come up with numbers and we just simply can't do that so we need to actually put a data system in place and we're beginning to work on that case management service uh, coordination process employment services as the primary goal for the person assuming that the person wants to work we have no desire to try and force someone who doesn't work into the workforce but for those who do wish to work we believe that should be the first and primary activity that they're taking part in uh, in their plan of care and we need to have case managers and support brokers who understand that expectation and that necessity and we need to plan for performance measurement and quality assurance that includes the publishing of data on employment outcomes and we have some of that the IPS program has a fidelity scale that is pretty impressive we're beginning to expand that fidelity scale beyond the IPS program to other programs and with the SCL waiver we're putting in place quality indicator tools that will actually measure the person's progress upon the outcome model uh, so as we begin to glean data from those kinds of activities we'll be far better informed about how things are going so why is employment first important to Kentucky well the, you can look at it from a couple of different directions one is a social services perspective and the other is an economic perspective and it's kind of important that we're able to communicate from both perspectives okay so from a social services perspective we know for a fact that the workforce participation rate for folks with disabilities is about a third of folks without disabilities that means about one-third of the total number of folks with disabilities are working as compared to the number of folks without disabilities that is a meaningful number unemployment rate is not a meaningful number if you haven't already figured that out unemployment rate just as a measure of how many folks who are looking for work are unable to find work at any given point in time the participation rate is very very important and we're lagging behind for people with disabilities um, this is a very serious issue right now we have about 13 million adults of working age who are receiving supports through Social Security and SSI 13 million adults of working age who want to work many of them but either because of myths don't believe that they can work or because of a lack of opportunity are not working so we need to change that it's been continuously shown without question that folks if they have assistance accommodation and encouragement can work and can be very successful I see it every day I'm fortunate that my brother-in-law who's a person with a disability works with me every day and loves his job does a great job um, so I know for a fact that people with disabilities can do the work and do the work as well as folks without disabilities in many many cases they just need support and training and a little understanding the Martin School at the University of Kentucky some time ago conducted some research based upon the uh, results of the National Core indicators and they determined pretty clearly that employment is a linchpin service for people with disabilities the NCI data showed without question that folks who were employed were happier than folks who were not employed folks who were employed were healthier than folks who were not employed and folks who were employed were less lonely those are very important facts that we need to keep in mind because if folks are happy healthy and not lonely what does that mean 
That means they're less likely to have behavioral issues. They're less likely to be expensive to support in the community. So by helping folks join the workforce, we can actually help them live a better life and a, more, a happier life. So let's look at it from an economic perspective. Uh, it really and truly can be a road out of poverty. Um, working age adults with disabilities live below the poverty line at twice the rate of folks without disabilities. And that's census data. Mathematical policy research, which is the agency that does work for uh, Social Security, tells us that two-thirds of folks in long-term poverty are people with disabilities. So if we're going to move forward, we need to address these facts. And Employment First will allow us to do that. Cost effectiveness. Well, there's a fellow up at Kent State University named Robert Shamara who's done a, a lot of really interesting economic research on, on employment. And he has determined without question that employment services is the least costly means of integrating folks into the community. In one study, he found that the total cost per hour of day activities was $17.01 while the total cost per hour of employment was $11.81. Now, we do have a higher rate for employment, but folks who are employed and properly employed are not supervised 100% of the time by a staff member, while folks in day programming are supervised 100% of the time by a staff member. So the total cost compare, in comparison was $17.01 for day programming and $11.81 <coughs> for employment. A second study that was done concurrently, it was determined supported employment was 65.9% less, percent, uh, percent less to provide than other day activities. So it makes economic sense from an economic effectiveness basis. From a cost efficiency basis, which actually is a little more important than, than, uh, than uh, effectiveness, he found that in measuring the real dollar benefit of folks with disabilities on public assistance who work, entered the workforce, he found that on average, every dollar spent to provide support and employment to folks returned a dollar and 46 cents per hour. So every, um, not per hour, per dollar. So you spend a dollar for support and employment, society is going to gain back a dollar and 46 cents. Okay? And that's on average. Even folks with multiple disabilities were found to return a dollar and 19 cents for every dollar invested. So it is an investment. It's not an expense. It's an investment. We as a society are always going to be better off for getting folks into employment. So we've had some successes. I mentioned before Kentucky's IPS program. The outcomes from the IPS program are absolutely fantastic. It works predominantly with folks with um, mental health issues and with substance abuse issues. The outcomes are tremendous, absolutely tremendous, and we're learning a great deal uh, about the way that they are successful and trying to apply it to other areas. And much to my surprise, when you look at National Core Indicators data from November 2011 to 2013, it appears that the number of, of folks with developmental and intellectual disabilities working in the community in Kentucky has doubled. That's what we expected to happen by the end of 2015. Now, that's a little sad to me because the reason for that is we had so few people actually working in the community <laughs> prior to 2011. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a success. And we have a lot of folks who have been working with us really, really hard to try and make things happen. And you'll see them up here on the screen. Um, there's room for other folks to be involved. And, and we would very much like to have other folks involved. So if you're part of an organization who would like to become involved with us as we make Employment First a reality in Kentucky, please get in touch with me and let me know. Uh, there is plenty of room and plenty of work to go around. Looking into the future. So what can we do today to help folks move towards self-sufficiency? Well, one of the things we can do 
is we can lobby Congress for a change in the SSI re resource limitations. They have been at $2,000 and $3,000 since 1989, I think. It's been a long, long time, uh, 24 years without change. And that still is an important number. I'm sure that most folks in here have heard about the ABLE Act, Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. Uh, and this is dated information because on Wednesday, the ABLE Act actually passed through the House with 404 votes in support. 17 votes against, 13 folks not voting. Um, so it was a tremendous first step. Um, there are more steps to come, uh, potentially and hopefully a vote in the Senate next week. Uh, again, we do have, actually, I believe it's now 76 co-sponsors in the Senate. Rand Paul still is not a co-sponsor. He's the only member of our delegation who is not. Um, but he does claim to be a supporter of it, which is good. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see what happens when the vote comes down. Uh, now, the ABLE Act is a, a wonderful opportunity for folks to begin uh, to do some more significant long-term financial planning. And we really haven't had the opportunity for some of that to occur. Uh, the ABLE Act, though, will do a couple of things. It will make uh, the uh, money put into the accounts tax-free, up to $100,000. And it will uh, seclude and not, it, it will ensure that money that's put into an ABLE account will not impact benefits, okay? Those are great things. Um, that's all it will do on the federal level. Implementation and how things are, are actually structured are left to the state. So when it passes, and I'm very, I'm gonna be very positive and say that it's gonna pass, I hope. Uh, when it does pass, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do because it would be a real shame if we couldn't get an implementation plan in place and get this implemented at the earliest possible date. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Now, with that said, ABLE Act is a tool. There are other tools out there that are still equally important. Special needs trusts, pooled income funds, because there are certain types of income that won't work in an ABLE account. An ABLE account can't deal with real property, can it? Special needs trusts can. And there are also some uses of funds that, uh, will, are, that won't be allowed from an ABLE account that will be allowed from special needs trusts. So it's an additional tool. It's part of, of really three tools that we have to help folks do long range financial planning. So understand that and understand that there are still needs for the, for the other tools. We need to, to be very, uh, up front with folks and help them understand the planning process, okay? One other thing we can do. Recent changes by CMS allow the establishment of Medicaid waiver programs across disability groups. In the past, we have always had to have programs for a specific disability group. Now we can have something called an I waiver, and an I waiver is, in essence, a SPI, a state plan amendment. So it would be possible for us to pull supported employment out of SCL, Michelle P, ABI, everything else that's in, and establish an employment only I waiver to expand the availability of long term supports to other folks. That's one of the big needs of the, uh, of the IPS program because we can help folks get jobs, but it's helping them keep the jobs that's the challenge, okay? So what would have to happen for this to work is we would have to set up certain eligibility requirement for the I requirements for the I waiver, okay? We could not afford to make uh, employment services available to every single person receiving Medicaid services because frankly every single person receiving Medicaid services doesn't need employment services. So we need to carefully define the population that we would be serving through an I waiver uh, and put the program in place so that we can have consistent employment programming across the board. That is the important key. 
Uh, that way we can all coordinate with OVR and make sure that folks are not left out in the cold. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking forward to in the future. Uh, by f how far down the road, I don't know. But I do believe that it is a real possibility for us as long as we can structure it in a w method that we can afford. And that is very important very important because we always have to pay attention to the cost of what we're doing. We have to make sure that the benefit at least equals the cost. Okay. None of this stuff happens without quality support employment. And again, I can't say enough good things about the kind of training that is done by the folks with the support employment training project. Uh, Milt and before Katie and now Katie directing the, the project. Uh, it's amazing for me to hear stories about folks coming from as far as South Carolina to receive training from our training project. Uh, that is just absolutely phenomenal. So there is no better way to understand supported employment than to uh, get the information directly from the training project. So I'm going to turn things over to Katie to move forward. Thank you. Well, apparently, whoever came the furthest today gets some sort of a prize. And if you can beat <laughs> South Carolina, Walt will make it a really big prize. <laughs> um, all right. Well, now we get to get um, into some of the fun stuff about how this really works. Um, thank you, Jeff, for the overview. Um, and when we say that Employment First is more than just a slogan, I think it also is more than something that should just strike fear into the hearts of people that don't want to hear about it. Um, and I think we do that by having employment done well, uh, making sure that employment supports are thoughtful and that they are done in a way that makes sense for people so people end up with jobs that are a good fit, something that they want to go to. Um, I don't know a lot of people in the room, and certainly not the people I can't see um, who are in other sites, so I don't know all the reasons why you're here. Um, I think some of you are family members of people who either receive employment supports or are looking for that. I think a lot of you are here because it's part of your job. Um, and for whatever reason, probably you have or have had a job, and you probably have had jobs that you like and jobs that you didn't like so much. And when you think about the two of those, there's reasons why some jobs that you actually get work out better for you than others. Um, so just keeping all of those kinds of things in mind. Um, so I'm going to spend some time now talking about expectations for quality employment supports and supported employment. And some newer ways of thinking about things and that how we think about people matters a great deal. Um, like Jeff said, if we're going to look at employment first as the first option for people who are receiving services, then we have to start with this idea of the presumption of employability. That everybody has something to offer that is worthy of pay. And then we're going to spend some time figuring out how we figure that out. Um, but just the, starting with that presumption of employability, that everybody is able to work, no matter the impact of the disability. And then looking at how we think about work. And oftentimes, we think about work, well, I go to work, and this is how I got my job. And I saw a posting, and there's a job description. And I think I qualify, so I applied, and I interviewed, and I beat out the other people to get that job. Um, and there's lots of different ways that people get work. And there's different ways to think about getting jobs. Um, and one is this idea of contribution versus competition, that negotiated jobs are a real and viable option for a lot of people and that we base finding jobs on what somebody has to contribute to an employer that has need of that rather than just thinking well I don't really know how this person's gonna beat out and compete other people to be able to get the job so really thinking about how we think about work and that when you boil the rest of my many many slides down because <laughs> um, I'm used to talking for like seven hours at a time, and I won't, I promise. It is Friday <laughs> afternoon. Um, but when you boil it all down, the goal of supported employment and of the employment specialist who does the work of supported employment is to learn what a job seeker has to offer, what they have to contribute, and then find a place of business that has need of that. That that's what we're really looking to try and do. And in order to do that, we have to think about jobs that fit that person. So these are all people who have an impact of disability in their life who work. And they all have a job that's a good fit for them. 
but there's nothing about each of these individual jobs that necessarily makes it a good job for a person with a disability. Right? It's a good job for Shelley. It's a good job for Mallory. Not that it's a good job for a person with a disability. So whatever it is you do in your walks of life, I know in my walk of life, I talk about employment for people with disabilities. And so I get a lot of response of, oh, well, that seems really nice. And then I get, so what is it that those people can do? And there isn't an answer to that question. I mean, everybody who's sitting here, you can rattle off the top of your head what the stereotypical jobs are that you see people with disabilities doing. Because oftentimes those are the easiest to compete for. And it's something someone can apply for and they can get. And so the stereotypes exist for a reason. But when it comes down to it, there isn't a good job for a person with a disability because people are so different and they're unique. And as with everybody, we have things that we have to offer that are our strengths and we have our support needs and we needed some tech help here and even the tech guy needed a little tech help. So we all need supported employment <laughs> of sorts in our lives. Um, when I can't get the copier to work, then I need somebody who can help me find the jam. I mean, we all have our supports that we need. Um, and so I think the only response to what is it people can do is, well, it depends on who that person is and what they have to offer. And then finding a business that, that needs that is how you find it. So when you hear about supported employment, these are the official phases of service um, that some of you have probably heard over and over, and some of you are figuring out and maybe have heard and didn't know what they mean. So in Kentucky, um, our Office of Vocational Rehabilitation contracts out support employment services to private provider agencies. Um, so someone would become a client with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and then they would refer them to an agency, possibly one they already work with or if they're new to the service system, another agency that would be a good fit for them. And this is what that provider agency would would provide for them. Um, so we have through VR milestone payments for what well, we in Kentucky call person-centered job selection, which is the process of discovery. And then there's another milestone payment for job development, um, which includes job analysis, but finding the job. So there's getting to know the person, then there's finding the job, getting the job, and then this idea, as Jeff talked about, of long-term supports over time. And so the first phase of service is person-centered job selection, um, or the discovery process. And it's, this is all about the how we think about people. And so we like to use this um, analogy of discovery from Mark Golden Associates, who has done a tremendous amount of work. Um, we base a lot of what we teach off of their teachings, um, and Matt Callahan, who heads that up now, that the tip of the iceberg is what we usually know about people, right? So it might be um, what you know from seeing them in your day program, it might be what comes in the referral from Vogue Rehab or from a first casual conversation with somebody. But if you're really gonna help somebody find a job, anybody with a job, let alone somebody with a significant impact of disability, you're gonna have to know a whole lot more. Because if I met you for 15 minutes, I probably would not know you well enough to find you a really good job, anybody. And so we really have to figure out how we get that information on the bottom of the pyramid. And oftentimes that's getting that information from somebody that people have had a hard time getting to know. Um, and so the role of the employment specialist is to figure out what are this person's interests? What are their talents? What are their ways of contribution? And how can I understand the functional impact of their disability? Because we need to know both sides of this. And the ways we would suggest doing that are through conversations with the job seeker. Certainly you're going to talk to the person about their likes, their interests, how they see um, their life and, and how they maneuver the world around them. And then also trusted others. Who, who else knows this person well? Is it a family member? Is it friends? Is it a trusted staff person? Is it their neighbor? Someone they worship with? Finding those other people in their life who already know them so that we can share that information. Um, and then really being intentional, intentional about how we get to know people, spending time in their typical life routines. So where does somebody spend their time right now? How do you spend your day? What do you like to do? What do you do well? And then sharing in those activities. So if someone volunteers in their church on a regular basis, going and doing that with them, right? If they have a neighborhood group that they're a part of, 
going and doing that with them, seeing what that's like. Um, and then moving into novel activities or new activities, going places where they aren't used to going, talking to people, you know, inner, getting to know people that they haven't known for a long time and seeing how people respond and how they learn and how they function there. Um, and then, of course, reviewing relevant records. Um, but it's all about finding that spark. Where is it where somebody might, it catches their attention in a different way? Where somebody all of a sudden goes from sitting like this because they're listening and listening to the services about them to where they sit up straighter in their chair? Or all of a sudden, whatever it is about that person that indicates that they're paying attention, it's there. And oftentimes, it's something that hasn't been discovered or hasn't been known, which is why we call it this process of discovery. It's getting to know somebody in a different way. Um, certainly, it's finding ways to promote genuine involvement and in opportunities for people, um, not just this idea of settling to keep people busy and keep them happy. Well, they have somewhere to be, and they're safe. And, and those are important. That those are important. We all want to have somewhere to be, and we all want to be safe. But surely, we want more than that, too. So how do we get to that next level with someone? How do we really learn what that can look like for somebody? And then testing what it is that everybody's already known about this person. Everybody knows Harold can't sit still. Everybody knows Harold's going to spit on people. Everybody knows da 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 list said behavior problems that Jeff referenced earlier. So when are the times when Harold sits still? When doesn't he spit on somebody? Right? So when are those exceptions? And there usually are. But we have to figure out what those are so that we can discern what the circumstances are around that and then figure out how that is going to fit into a workplace. Um, and Lori Norton, who heads up um, in Kentucky the Dartmouth Project with the IPS model, who is phenomenal at this kind of work, has this idea of thinking in questions and always questioning what it is we learn so that we can learn more about it. Um, and Mike Callahan, who now runs Mark Golden Associates, had a quote that I think is really powerful, that severe disability is like a fog obscuring the best that people have to offer. It's so easy, as probably all of you know, to become identified by your disability. You become that label, that diagnosis, that behavior, that whatever it is. Um, and so it's really kind of putting that to the side and figuring out who this person is so that we can undercover those gifts and talents and interests and see more about that person. Um, and then Siva Shumpert, who is a colleague of his, had said in a presentation that the people you see every day can be the hardest to get to know. Just because we've seen this person in our classroom for many years, just because we've seen this person in our day program and known them there for many years, Looking at work and integrated work and individualized work is a really different way of getting to know somebody. Which is another way of saying just because you've been annoyed by this person and just because you've seen all their negative behaviors that they have at the day program doesn't mean that that's going to be the case on the job. And in fact, time and time again, I hear from people, you know what, Robert has a behavior plan this long and all kinds of issues, but when he's at work, you don't see any of that. It's like they just go away. Well, there's reasons why people are different when they're diff in different places and the expectations are different and the circumstances are different. Um, and, but this can be a really challenging thing to remember when we're in the thick of it and we're busy and we have lots of different people we're trying to figure out things for and trying to set our priorities. Um, but just, again, that presumption of employability and giving people a chance at getting to know them in a different way. Um, and that we as employment specialists and those of us figuring out about employment have to dig into getting to know people because you really, you're not going to get the best information if you just ask. And while it seems like it makes a lot of sense if you're talking to someone about work by starting with, so where do you want to work or what do you want to do, um, that that's a really loaded question. If heaven forbid, and my supervisors are here, so please don't think I want this to happen, but if I lost my job today and I cried for a while and then somebody said, what do you want to do, I'd probably just cry some more. I wouldn't have an answer to that question. It's a really hard question um, for a lot of us, and especially for someone where work hasn't been an expectation. And that was the case for your cousin many years ago, and um, unfortunately, it's still the case for a lot of people. They haven't had experiences in their life that have given them the opportunity to think about work. Right? If you didn't go on all the field trips when you were in school, if you didn't participate in career day, if you have, people haven't been asking you since you were a child, what do you want to do, and helping you think about that, 
then there isn't the framework to have an answer for that question. Um, or a lot of times people have been in the system for quite a while and there's always been this menu of what's offered. So do you want to do this, 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 or this? And you choose from it. And so thinking about what else could be possible hasn't been an option and nobody's really thought about it. Um, a lot of people don't know their talents or their interests, right? They follow what's going on. Or somebody has said, well, I think someday you could be, probably be a pretty good dishwasher, and so that's what they want to do, and haven't thought about anything else. Um, and the bottom one, Michael Kendrick, who does a lot of work in this field and thinking about people in meaningful ways, talked about avoiding the idea of abandoning people to choice. And don't think that I'm... We don't think that here at the Human Development Institute, we don't want people to have a choice, um, all for self-determination. But if you're going to have a choice, it has to be a real choice. And it has to mean something. And if you don't know what the possibilities of work are, then you're not making a choice by just saying yes or no. If all you've ever known about work is seeing people at McDonald's, or that was your one job, and you didn't like it, then what you learned was you didn't like work. And so if someone says, do you want to go to work, and you say no, that's your choice. But that's really unfair on our parts, if that's all the choice that was given. And so instead, starting with questions like, so what do you like? What do you do well? How do you spend your time? Um, who else do you know that can help us get insight in getting to know you better? Um, I think probably a lot of us could think of other folks in our lives that we know who could list our strengths really well, probably more than we could, right? Um, and again, starting with the familiar in people's lives and then moving into new things. And so we off, or I often use um, Jessica and her story as an example of this process. So I think it's always helpful to think about things with real stories. Um, and Jessica was a young woman who was getting ready to leave high school here in Kentucky. And there was a local agency that she was going to work with. And the employment specialist came to meet with her and her family. She lived at home with her parents. Um, and so they met together to talk about what supported employment is see if this is something that they were going to be interested in to figure out ways to get to know Jessica, just get this process started. And the first thing Peggy, the employment specialist, learned was there will absolutely be no McDonald's. Jessica um, does have an intellectual disability. She has cerebral palsy that impacts her um, and that she uses crutches to, to walk and to maneuver around. And in high school, her work transition job had been to be a lobby attendant at McDonald's. And for lots of reasons, this did not work well for Jessica. And while she had always enjoyed going to school and had friends and had, you know, gone to school fine, when, this, when she was working here, it suddenly became a struggle and she didn't want to go anymore for the first time. And what Jessica learned was that she didn't want to work, or that she didn't like to work, because she didn't like McDonald's. There were lots of reasons why it wasn't a good fit. Um, and it was one of those, they will always have somebody from the school and people could transition through different jobs. And, and the idea is you get to try different kinds of work and see what you like. Um, but the reality was there wasn't anything personalized about it for her. So when the question came, Jessica, would you like a job after high school? Jessica said no, because she had learned that she didn't want to work. So with all the wonderful intentions of the SCL2 waiver, where you have to have this conversation, at least on an annual basis, of are you interested in going to work, the conversation was had and Jessica made her choice and she said it very clearly. So somebody could check off the box, she said no, and carry on with their life, and she'd have gone to the sheltered workshop as planned. And thankfully, somebody said, well, what if we think about work in a different way? So she had an employment specialist who took the time to look at the situation in a bigger way and offer more to the choice than just McDonald's. And I think with the insurance, all right, so we're not going to McDonald's, we'll have nothing to do with fast food. And then she was okay with starting the conversation. And so it started with what do, where does she spend her time? What does she like to do? And just by visiting with her at home, she likes to spend a lot of time on the computer, as lots of teenagers do. So you want to see what does she do on the computer? And there's all kinds of things you can learn just by watching somebody do what it is they typically do. So Peggy got a really good feel for her fine motor skills and how she could use the computer. And she liked to play games. And so you look at, all right, well, what kind of games do you like to play? And she liked to play design games, where she would put together the decor of a room, or outfits and fashion and those kinds of things. Um, and because she was in her home and she, Peggy had been welcomed into her home to talk to her and her family, she saw her room. Because when you're a teenager, your room is your place, right? That's your domain. Um, and so Jessica's mother had Peggy show her, showed Peggy her room and saw that 
Peggy made the comment, this just looks really nice. Like it was all decorated really well. And if I were to decorate a room really well, it would come out of a package from some store where everything comes together because I would never in a million years pull things out of the air that would look good together. But Jessica did. Her mom said, oh yeah, she did this. She designed the whole thing and, and picked out the drapes and the lamp and the, the rug and everything. And Peggy thought, oh, well that's pretty interesting. But if Peggy's like me, you know, just because it looks good to me doesn't mean it actually looks good to people who know this kind of thing. Um, so then she talked to some people at school, because Jessica had been in school, and people at school knew her. She'd been in the school system all of her life, and found out that she really liked her art class. And there was another teacher where she knew that Jessica had this beautiful penmanship. And so when there were thank you notes to write, that Jessica would be the one who would write the thank you notes. Um, so even though her academic skills might not have been the strongest, she was the one who would write the thank you notes because she had this gorgeous penmanship. And so just from this little bit, you can start to see this theme of that she has this interest and ability in making things look beautiful, right? This color coordination and an eye for this kind of things, and that she enjoys that, and that's what she gravitates to naturally. And while there are a lot of people who care about Jessica and wanted to see good things, the conversation started with she doesn't want to work because she hated McDonald's. It didn't start with, oh my gosh, she has this ability to make things look beautiful. You should really think about things in that way when you think about work. But then Peggy had to think, all right, well, that's awesome, but there's probably the term starving artist for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. And so how are we going to think about this in a vocational way? Because it's really fun to get to know somebody, but the goal is a job. And we always have to keep that in mind. So they took some classes together at Michael's, the big box store, artsy crafty stuff, and they offer classes in the evenings. So she went with Jessica to take these classes together, right? So this is all a part of this discovery process. How do we get to know Jessica in vocationally relevant ways? And there happened to be a class on floral design. So they took it together. Um, so here Peggy could see, okay, I've talked to her teachers and seen how she functions in the school system where she's grown up and where people know her. So what happens when you go to a new place? And the instructor is new, and the other people in her class are new, and now they're not necessarily peers of her age. There's different people. How does she function around the setting? Um, how does she learn? How does she take instruction? And so by doing this together, she could learn all of this stuff about Jessica. And, and she did really well in the class. Um, the main support that she needed was she would go up to the counter where the flowers were and she would select the flowers she wanted and Peggy would help her get them back to her workstation. Um, she enjoyed getting to know other people. She could take some, the instruction and you know, have conversations about it so she understood what was going on. But at the end of the class, then Peggy could also talk to the instructor, who knew why Peggy was there, and say, so how do you think Jessica's done in this class? And the instructor said, well, you know, she has more innate skill at this than the last couple people I've hired. So here's some justification, that this isn't just Peggy thinking, well, she seems to have a real knack for it, because I can think somebody put something together that looks pretty too, but people who really know about it are likely to disagree with me, because I don't know what I'm talking about. But this woman knew what she was talking about. So not only do we think Jessica has this ability, now we have justification of it as well, because we found somebody who's familiar with this kind of stuff, who's met Jessica, so we have verification of it, Jessica's had some experience with the new skill. Now we have somebody who could likely be a reference from her. Oh yeah, well she took the class here at Michael's and this is what I thought of her work and the kind of designs that she did. And you also have a connection with somebody who probably knows people in the artsy, making things look pretty world in the community where she lives. I don't know a lot of people that get paid in that. And no employment specialist can know everything. Sometimes we want to have such high hopes for our employment specialists that they know everything there is to know about the business world. Well, if you find one like that, that's awesome. And please send me their name so that we can tap into them and get them to share their knowledge more. But it really is a group effort. And so here's somebody that can help us with that networking. So in sorting things out for Jessica of all the time that was spent with her, you could boil it down to here's some ideal work tasks for Jessica. So what's going to be best for her? Something that would use her interest and ability in making things look beautiful. Something that's going to use her good communication and people skills. Something that will use her ability to use her hands to do detailed work. She likes to do that. She's good at it. And quite frankly, if you meet someone who has an intellectual disability and has cerebral palsy and uses their crutches to get around, if suddenly you see them use their hands to do detailed work, you're going to go, huh, well, I didn't really expect that. 
And that's what we want to find. What's going to make other people look at Jessica in a way that they wouldn't upon first glance? It shows her value, it shows what she has to offer, and it gets people to think of her in competent ways. An ideal setting would be a workplace that has relatively open spaces so she can safely navigate through with her crutches. And if you've been to Michael's, or at least the ones I've been in, they cram as much crafty stuff in that store as they possibly can. I mean, I bump, and I am not a crafty person. I have to go in there from time to time, and it, it's just so overwhelming. <laughs> and it's hard to get through. Um, so when you have that class, lots of people jump to, oh my gosh, we could just get her a job at Michael's. That woman said she's really talented. Well, there's lots of reasons why that doesn't fit some of these other things, right? So that's why we have to be paid attention to what we've learned. And then if we're looking at co-workers for Jessica, ideally we'd find some place with a consistent group of people who can invest time in Jessica's instruction. And while we can't guarantee that there's not going to be turnover at a workplace, as an employment specialist we can learn what the typical turnover rate is and know if people have been there for a long time or if there's constant turnover. And if it's a place where there's often turnover, people come and they might stay for a little bit but they don't stay very long, then it's always someone new who's having to get to know Jessica over again. And if it takes a little bit longer to get to know her and how she learns and how she functions, that's going to be really hard when it's always new people that are her coworkers. So you at least want to find somewhere where there's the likelihood that that will be consistent. You're going to find people who share her artistic interests because that's her passion and her interest. And it's, she likes to be around like-minded people. And quite frankly, most of us do, right? So how can you find other people that share those interests of hers? And outgoing people um, that are going to you know, help get to know her and, 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 and enjoy being with. So once we have that list of what we know about Jessica, then we'd suggest having a job planning meeting, pulling a group of people together who care about Jessica, who know her, and who want to see good things happen for her, and having a targeted conversation about it. Um, so here's some people that you would want to be a part of this meeting, um, and really looking at having an equal number of paid and unpaid people as much as you possibly can, because they know her in different ways. right? You have people that know her from if she has other services, that's what I mean by paid people. So if you have someone who's already a part of a program, um, then you'd have their staff. You'd have their maybe their ADT staff and residential staff, case managers, whoever those people are. And they know them in that realm, but then also people who know her just because they know her. They're a neighbor or a friend, and they know Jessica because they like her and they just want to be around her. So it gives you a balance of how people know her and what they know about her. And the goal of this meeting is to come up with a targeted job development list. So when you have a balanced group of people at your meeting, then you have people with lots of different connections. If a lot of us live and work in this disability service world, then most of our friends and people we know live and work in the disability service world. So a lot of my friends are either in this room or work in this place, or there are other social justice people, right? Because those are my friends. So. Those are people I know. So when we bring in her neighbors, family friends, other people, then they bring with them their contacts, their networks. What are their social circles? What are their professional circles? And we really increase our network in trying to think about where we can go to help Jessica find a job. So we think about what are these ideal tasks and setting and coworkers for her, because quite frankly, someone's being paid to help her find a job, so we want to stack the deck in her favor as much as possible. So thinking about this and what we know about her, and then our work tasks that we could see Jessica doing that fit what we know about her, and not job titles, but just work tasks. Start thinking about that. And then once we have a list of tasks, what are businesses in our area that have need of that task that fit what we know about Jessica? Because if we're going to do person-centered job selection, it always has to start with a person. And this is a way to make sure we keep going back to, but this is what we know about Jessica, and do those things fit. And so in Jessica's meeting, this is the kind of list that they came up with. All right, so thinking of what we know about her, floral design, for obvious reasons, came up. She'd taken the class and she liked it. Um, but nail tech work, right? People pay good money to have their nails done, and people can do some really intricate, cool designs. And my nails don't look like that, but a lot of people's look really good because somebody's skilled at doing that. Um, display setup, other types of design work, interior design work, cake decorator, right? And then where are places that have need of that work 
And then who do you know there? Because it's all well and good, I can be the best employment specialist on the planet, but if I call and say I'm helping a woman named Jessica look for work, would you like to talk to me? Probably if they don't know who I am, they're going to say no. But if I say, well, Joan Smith suggested that I give you a call, suddenly they're a whole lot more likely to say yes because I don't want Joan Smith mad at them. Right? And if that's the reason I get in, that's the reason I get in, but now I have their attention and can get a meeting. So connections are everything. And this, is, this meeting can be a great way to expand our networks and get those connections. And then you see the numbers to the left of, well, if you're not looking at me, if you see the screen, you'd see the numbers to the left of the list. And so Jessica and her family prioritized. This is where I'd like you to go first, second, third, fourth. This is what I'm most interested in. So it gives the employment specialist where they're going to go, who they're going to talk to, what kind of work they're looking for, and why they're there. So when we get into job development, that's the basis for our job development script. This is your pitch and how you're going to talk to an employer. So when we get into talking about job development, this is the how we think about work part. And first, we always want to start with what we know about the person, right? All that stuff we learned about Jessica, whoever we're talking about, building that targeted job development list, like we had on the right side of that bracket, and then continuing to network as we go, right? This idea of, well, you know what? Jessica sounds really interesting, but we really aren't hiring, or we only hire family, or whatever the reason is, that, well, okay, you know, thanks for taking time to talk with me. Can you think of other places that could use what Jessica has to offer? And continuing to build our network and making those connections, and then going back and talking to Jessica and her family about that. Well, I got this other great lead. Would you be interested if I went and talked here? And knowing that how people get jobs, and this is just Department of Labor statistics. This isn't people with disabilities statistics. People get jobs. It's not just what you can do. It's who you know, right? Probably a lot of us got our jobs somehow based on who we know. And so we want to make sure we do that when we're looking at supported employment as well. So we use who the job seeker knows, who their family knows, who the employment specialist knows, who other people in their life know to expand that network because a lot of times employment specialists are those connectors, right? We're the person who connects Jessica with other people, with a potential employer, with someone else who's interested and knows about the field that she's interested in. So when we're talking about job development, we're often talking about two different times, types of job development. So there is the way that most people are familiar with, which we call labor market, supported employment job development, which is looking at open positions that already exist. There's a written job description. Um, we have someone who meets the need, that meets the job description, is qualified to do that, applies for the job, and gets it. Um, and then there's customized job development. And this is, and, and both of them start with discovery, but then customized employment takes, this is what we know about the person, their strengths, their needs, their interests, and then negotiates a job that did not exist before with an employer that has need of what this person has to offer. So it meets the needs of both, and it has to meet the needs of both, right? The person and the business. It has to be a benefit to that business as well. Right? And the bottom line is, whether you're doing labor market job development or customized job development, it always goes back to what we learned about that person. And that's how we get out of, but I can't find anything but McDonald's, or I just put in applications everywhere. Well, what does that have to do with what you know about the person? So it always ties back in with discovery. Um, if somebody is going out and looking for a labor market job, I, we still teach talk, starting with these kinds of questions. Um, because the question, hi, my name is Katie and I help people with disability find jobs. Are you hiring? <laughs> Guess what the answer is to that question? It is oftentimes no. Um, maybe not always, but oftentimes. So we start with these kinds of questions and learn about that business. We call it job development, not job finding for a reason. You're developing relationships with employers um, and developing these connections. So what type of work do you do here? What's important to your company? What sets of skills do you look for when you're hiring? Right? So finding this kinds of things out about employers where you think somebody is going to have something to offer them. And in labor market, that they're going to be able to apply for one of their positions and, and meet those needs. 
And then in customized, it's really about figuring out employer needs, employee contributions, and then it's a voluntary negotiation. Nothing mandates that an employer has to customize or create a position for a person with a disability. Um, it certainly can be a part of the ADA and then employment protections, but it's not spelled out that it's forcing an employer to have to customize a job. So it is a voluntary negotiation, and so it really has to meet the needs of both. And it isn't something that I made up, and it isn't something that Milton made up, or the Support Employment Training Project. It's a part of um, the Department of Labor, and you can find information about it on their website. Um, but it's all about individualizing that employment relationship between employers and employees in a way that meets the needs of both. And if you're going to do that, again, we have to really know who this person is. We've got to know all this deeper stuff if we're going to be able to talk about that person and then seek out what they have to offer in a place of employment. And customized employment really starts with the presumption of employability for everybody. And this idea of contribution versus competition, that everybody has something to offer. And customized employment really is looking at taking out competition. Um, this is Mallory, and she's a woman who lives here in Kentucky. And she, you can see, she's working. She ended up getting a job um, reading to children at child care centers. Um, Mallory does not speak. And her one voluntary movement is to turn her head to one side. And so it really started with the presumption of employability. I don't know what work's going to look like, but everybody has something to offer. And then it's our job to figure out what that's going to be. So Mallory probably is going to have a hard time and isn't going to compete on the open market. It's going to be hard for her because of the impact of disability and other people with a significant impact of disability to go out, fill out an application, and compete for a job with everybody else who's looking for work. But there are things that she has to offer and to contribute, and so we start with that. And there's different ways to think about customized employment. Um, and one is unbundling demand. So this is Daniel, and Daniel probably could go out and compete on the open market and get a job, and lots of people do, right? There's people that with disabilities, and they go out and they fill out an application for some of the places that popped into your minds earlier, to Kroger, to McDonald's, to Walmart, to wherever, entry-level service jobs, and they could compete and they could get the job. But there's a lot of things that he has to offer that he can do but that might not fit all of the requirements of set job descriptions that exist. So customized employment is a way not just for him to get into the world of work, but to get into the world of work that uses what he has to offer with a much more interesting and a much more fitting job than an entry level service sector job. And so his customized work really looked at unbundling the demand of a workplace. So these are things that Daniel can do and what he has to offer, and then going into an office and finding not just job descriptions, but what are all the tasks that get done at this place. And then pulling some of those tasks out and putting them into another job description that makes sense and benefits that business. So this is some of the work that he does. Um, he works part-time at Dr. Lahaki's office in Louisville, and it was a really good job. It was a good fit for him. People liked him. He did good work. He worked on patient charts and time cards and different things in the office for the doctor's office, but it was a part-time job. And an employment specialist noted, you know, he's got this really great part-time job, but he could do a lot more, and there's a lot more hours in the week when he could be productive and contributing and be making money. But there wasn't more work at that office, and so he got a second part-time job. And it was also a customized position that used the same kinds of tasks. So here you see him um, doing work at Ceridian and um, keeping track of records there. They make um, processed gift cards. Like when you go to Kroger and you see the wall of gift cards at the checkout lane, they make those. And so he has a second job that's there as well. So he wasn't going to apply for a job that already existed at those places and get it, but there's a lot he had to offer those businesses that made sense for them where he was able to get a negotiated, customized job that was a good fit for him and a good fit for the employer. Um, some places that take advantage of specific competencies. So this is a man named Michael Down and um, was in Princeton, Kentucky and had a customized job where um, 
a long story, but one thing that Michael does really well and what works best for him is consistency and predictability and things being really accurate. And so um, he'd had a job at Dairy Queen that for lots of reasons didn't work out very well. And so an employment specialist who said, okay, here's what we know about Michael. I'm going to look somewhere very different than Dairy Queen for work this next time. And just spent time doing job analysis. And she had an inn at a place, um, truss wall, that made metal trusses, roofs, for buildings. And she said, can I come, you know, here's a man that I'm working with and trying to figure out work. Can I come and learn more about your business? And she observed um, some of the highly skilled folks at this business, welders and tool and die makers, leaving their workstations and drilling these bits for the punch for the punches to make the tresses. And they'd come off of that work and they'd do this and sometimes they'd have it right and sometimes not and they'd waste a little bit of material getting it just accurate and they'd chat on their way over there and talk about the ball game scores and whatever else is going on and they might chat a little bit on the way back. Um, and it worked fine for everybody. Nobody was upset with this process. But when she asked, she said, have you ever thought about hiring someone to do, to just do the punches? She said, no. She said, well, have, would you consider hiring someone just to do that task? And he said yes. And they were looking at getting a new machine for this and they hired Michael just to do that one part of it. And this is a, you know, a welding tool and die shop in rural Kentucky. It's not like it's a bunch of big human service -y kind of people that really just want to help out somebody with a disability. These are guys who go to work and but they said that they would do it. So when people say, oh, but nobody would really do customized employment, it, it works. And it works in small towns and it works in big cities. Um, so he was hired. He started at part time and ended up bumping his hours up to full time. And he was paid, I think he started somewhere around nine or ten dollars an hour. And this was quite a few years ago. But the other guys that were working there might have been making 17, 20, and 23 dollars an hour, but they had their skill, right? They were certified, they were welders, they were tool and die makers. Michael didn't have that same trade skill, so he, but he was making fair wage. It was a, well above minimum wage. It wasn't the same wage as other people, but it was a fair wage for the work that he was doing. So it was good money for him, it was a really good fit, and it helped the business because he could focus on this task at nine or $10 an hour, and the other guys could focus on their task at 20, 23 dollars an hour, and so the business came out ahead. Um, this Michael, um, this is a customized job at a hospital um, up in northern Kentucky and Michael uses a wheelchair as you can kind of see, um, has spastic cerebral palsy and he does part of a phlebotomist job. And a phlebotomist is the person who comes and sticks you at the hospital and so <laughs> with spastic cerebral palsy he is not sticking people with needles but the other part of the job is data entry and getting um, blood work down to the lab and making sure everything is accurate and the results come back in a timely manner because hospitals have efficiency standards and there is no room for error and people want the results and they want them as quickly as possible and the employment specialist just saw that it was they were not getting things back as quickly as they wanted the office desk part of this um, department wasn't working as smoothly as maybe it could have been and so they talked about the possibility of hiring someone to do this part of the job and so Michael is very accurate on the computer he's not the fastest person on a computer but it's going to be right and when it comes to having your lab results you have to make sure that it's right and accuracy is essential and so he enters information on the computer and he has wheels and he can get down to the lab really quickly and get back and it's not wearing him out um, so it, was, it met the need for the hospital. Results were still coming in, but not at the rate that they wanted. And so he was help, help, able to help meet this unmet need of reaching that efficiency standard. Um, another example of unmet need, um, this is Keith who had a job with Louisville Magazine. And when the employment specialist went in and asked about the business and develop that relationship with an employer. Now you're not asking someone about unmet need when you first meet them. I mean you have to get to know the employer, get to know their business, they trust you, they see that you're really interested in them, and then get to the question of, so are there things that don't happen in the way you'd like them to happen? Are there things that just don't, you know, people, they get done when somebody gets around to doing them, but they don't get done in the way you'd like them to get done. Um, and one of the things that turned out were subscription renewals which were a really important part of a magazine operation. Um, 
And so they ended up hiring Keith, and this job didn't exist before, but then it did, just to keep track of all the subscription renewals and make sure that those notifications went out in a timely manner. So it was something that a need of the business that wasn't being met in the way they needed it being met. And so it, it added value to their business um, to hire somebody to do that position. Um, this is Tim, and he was hired to do part of a job, um, and this was in more of a factory hands-on type setting, and it was, the, it was a small business, and it was the kind of place where everybody did everything, and it was proposed, would you consider hiring Tim just to do this one part? I think he'd be really, really good at it, he has a lot to offer, and they said yes. This can be harder to do in a tough economy, because I don't have to say yes, right? I mean, nobody has to say yes to any of this. We can just propose it. Um, and it worked out well, and over time, he did more of the tasks. But when we look at customized employment, unmet need can be an easier sell to an employer because it really is helping their bottom line in a more significant way or an easier way for them to grasp. So when an employment specialist goes in and is talking to an employer initially, and they know they're looking for customized employment, right? This person is going to do best and be able to use more of what it is they have to offer if we can customize a job, negotiate something new. These are the kind of questions that we would suggest that people start with. Um, ha being very open-ended, right? We're not asking, do you have any openings right now? Because we're not looking for openings, we're looking for opportunities within that business. So can you tell me about your business and your products and services? What's most important to your company? What types of work are done here? Not what jobs, but what types of work get done here? And then what about those additional tasks, things that happen when people have time to do them? Um, what happens when those things don't happen as you need them to, right? So going through these lists of questions. And then finding time to go in and learn more about that company, taking tours, having conversations, and seeing how things go so that we as the employment specialist can propose this customized job and have that conversation with them. Well, have you thought about would it be helpful to have somebody who does these tasks? So when we're doing job development, this is the kind of stuff that we're always talking about, um, right? Knowing the rules of sale and how to talk business language. So you have employment specialists who have to really get to know somebody with a disability, but then also be able to be comfortable in a place of business and talk the language of that business. Um, having informational interviews and learning about that business, learning about that field of interest someone has, negotiating um, those positions and representing the job seeker in agreed upon terms. So if an employment specialist is going out and representing somebody, then they need permission, right, to disclose that they have a disability, and they need permission to talk about somebody in certain ways. So having those conversations during discovery, what can I say about you? Um, and if you don't want me to say Joe has autism, then what can I say, right? So functional descriptions that you can use, but understanding what those, um, what that agreement is so that you can go out and represent a job seeker and start with what they have to offer and what they do best and how they can be a benefit to your business rather than starting with I happen to I help people with disability find jobs but what is it that this person has to offer and then we get into the idea of natural supports right so I think natural supports is a, a buzzword right now, and we hear a lot about it and more and more here lately. Um, it's been around for a really long time. People have been publishing about natural supports since the 80s. Um, but natural supports don't necessarily happen naturally. We have to figure out what is typical and what is natural in that business so that an employment specialist can make those kinds of connections. And in order to do that, we talk about conducting a job analysis. So if we've spent all this time getting to know the job seeker and really figuring out who this person is and what makes them tick and what they have to offer and where they're going to do best and what that setting is all going to look like, then it makes sense that we would also spend time in that place of business figuring out what is the culture of this business? What are people like? How do people typically learn the job? Learning all these things about a company, the ways, the means, the people. Um, one, to determine if it's going to be a good fit, because if we don't think it's going to be a good fit, then we don't want to help somebody get a job there. Because we want to make sure that we're setting someone up for the highest likelihood of success. And then if it does seem like it's going to be a good fit and that it's likely that they're going to get a good job, get a job there, 
We need to know the ways of this company, what's important there, um, how do people learn the job, who typically teaches them, and if we as the employment specialist understand that, then we can devise a plan so that orientation and the initial training on the job goes as smoothly as possible with the goal of having the typical people in that business provide that as much as possible. So that rather than just placing somebody into a job and training them on the job and fading, which is a, kind of the older style of supported employment, that we've really individualized where we're going and looking for a job. It's not just a placement. It's a really well thought out job that we're looking for. And that rather than us as the employment specialist doing all the training, that we're more the bridge to the typical people who would provide that instruction. Because every place um, is going to have somebody that teaches new employees how to do the job, or that shows them the ropes, shows them what, how to do things and how to function within that business. So it's our job to be the connector and to make sure people learn that in the way that most people do, and that we're then there to help support or add additional training and support if and when needed, but that we don't get in the way of what would typically happen for a new employee. Because the goal is for somebody to not only be employed, but to be employed as a valued employee, to be seen as a coworker in that business, and for them to become independent on the job. That that employment specialist is not going to be there attached at the hip forever and ever. So we need to be able to determine when to get involved and when to get out of the way and let people learn and, and have things unfold in a business as they typically will. Um, and I really like the phrase that Milton had found by Dave Mank, who's done a tremendous amount of work in the field of supported employment. He's at the USED up at Indiana University. Um, and he had the very academic description of once funky, always funky. If you start things out weird, they're going to stay weird over time. And our goal is for things not to be weird, right? Yes, this might be a person with a significant impact of disability, but they're a person who has something to offer your business. That's why I've helped facilitate them getting a job here. And I want them to be seen as a valued coworker. And this idea of long-term supports, that it is, we are there to help and assist over time, that's what makes supported employment unique and different than other vocational services and other things Office of Vocational Rehabilitation does but that it's not one-on-one -on -one forever. There is not a definition of supported employment, federally or in Kentucky, that says an employment specialist or job coach will be with you all of the time. It's not the definition of supported employment. Um, but on the other hand, for those people who don't have the magical Medicaid waiver that will pay you a nice rate these days for long-term supports, it's also not get somebody a job and dump them. It's not a postcard once a year that says, call me if you need anything. <laughs> um, so it's got to be that happy medium and what makes sense for the person. The typical um, minimum expectation of voc rehab, which is the initiator of supported employment services in our state, is that there would be at least two contacts a month. So if somebody's independent on the job, doing what they need to do, they don't need somebody with them there all the time, um, that you would still touch base with that person a couple times a month, and, and one of those times should be in person. And that once you have a great job, don't stop there. right? So. Jessica got a really good job coming out of school. It was a great job. It was a really innovative job. But five, seven years down the road, a part-time job doing the exact same thing she'd been doing isn't such a cool job anymore. Probably a lot of us aren't doing the same thing we were five or seven years ago. And even if you work at the same place, you're probably not doing the exact same tasks. Right? We all want to try new things and learn more things, take on more responsibility, increase our hours, make more money. My gosh, if we aren't earning some more money when we work, um, there is a lot more to work than money. But earning money is a big reason why we go to work. So looking at job advancement. Um, and long-term supports helps make sure people don't get stuck. It's not just making sure they show up every day. It's not just making sure they don't have behaviors that were written in a behavior plan 10 years ago. It's making sure that people are advancing and that they're growing and learning in that job as well. And so these are the kind of things that employment specialists need to be learning, right? If we've set this up and help people learn the job from typical people, then hopefully they've gotten to know their coworkers and they know who that point person is that they can go and ask for questions or how to maneuver their way around the office and to be as independent as they possibly can. Um, so now we need to learn, is work getting done? 
Um, does the employee know what to do and where to go for help? Are those natural supports still as effective? Right? Are the people who were their supports and coworkers at the time you got the job, are they still there? And do they still talk to them the way they did? Um, if the office has been rearranged, if now you know, people were all had in an open space and now everybody's all excited because they've got their own office and there's a door. <laughs> or now we've got walls and we don't have to look at each other all the time. Well, some people might really like that, but now that person doesn't have as easy access to those natural supports that were there before. We need to be there often enough so that we see those kinds of things happening. And do we need to make some different plans when it comes to long-term supports. Is this person seen as a valued employee? And this is huge. Are they seen as a valued employee or do they just show up and everybody tolerates them? Right? If they miss a day, do people notice? And is the work that they're not getting done missed? If they miss a day, who calls? Do they call? Or does the employment specialist call? Or does their mother call? Like, when you're an employee of a business, then you're probably the one calling and saying, I'm going to be in sick, or however you clock in a sick day. Um, so making sure that those things are happening. And is the person, are they still contributing the way they were when they first were employed, or under, are they underutilized now? What might be a really challenging job for somebody who doesn't have a lot of work experience at first might not be such a challenging job three months, six months, two years down the road. So now, is there a whole lot of downtime? So do we need to find more tasks and other things for people to do? Um, I mean, I know people who have been successfully employed and independent on the job for 12, 15 years, but those tasks keep changing. And as the nature of the business changed, sometimes those tasks disappear. Right? If you know somebody who was hired and they do mail delivery and copies and distribute faxes, guess what? That stuff just isn't there as much as it used to be. So we need to find other things so that the work that they do stays relevant. Um, and it's a conversation with that person and their employer, with the employment specialist and the employer and the employee, that everybody keeps that good relationship and can have those ongoing conversations to make sure that this valued employee remains a valued employee. That we're there and ready to help somebody advocate, um, either kind of coach them and talking about, well, this is how you can go in and have the conversation with your employer about taking on new tasks or wanting new hours or going in with them. Um, being present at annual evaluations is a common thing for an employment specialist to be able to do over the long haul. If everybody else has an annual evaluation, then the employee who just happens to have a disability should also be having an annual evaluation, right? Um, making sure communications are clear, not, well, you know, she has a hard time understanding, so could you ask her again? But, you know, making sure that p employees are being talked to by an employer the way that other employees are. And then looking for new jobs or new responsibilities. Um, people lose jobs. It happens. Businesses close. People get fired, companies downsize. There's lots of reasons why people lose jobs. Um, and there's lots of reasons why people want new jobs. Right? Just because I've never, maybe if I haven't worked before and I just, we want to find something so I can start working, get some confidence up, realize that I can do this, that I can be somewhere every day and follow the schedule and learn new things. Okay, well this is good, but this is what I'm interested in. I'd really like to take on something different. There's lots of reasons people find new jobs and then in supported employment, we should be watching for that, right? And that we as employment specialists can go back and repeat person-centered job selection, job development, job analysis um, to help somebody find either an additional job, like Daniel did where he found that second job, or a different job. That there are ways through the waiver program to increase those long-term support hours and do person-centered job selection and job development. Talking to the case manager, um, you know, for folks who are in the waiver programs and folks in the Dartmouth program, having that communication with the rest of that person's team is so important that everybody's on the same page and that employment is seen as a valuable person, part of that person's life. Um, and so I hear a lot after I give these kinds of overviews of what good supported employment should look like. Um, the next question is usually, okay, so where can I find that and how come that hasn't been my experience? <laughs> Because, quite honestly, it isn't always done um, to this extent that we talked about. 
And so we, other people who want to see folks get good jobs and to help them get good jobs, I think we all need to be a part of making the system better. Because we do need a lot of good quality supported employment um, here in Kentucky and across the country. I think from what I hear, we, we have a lot more supported employment than a lot of states do. So our capacity is there. We have ways to have provider agencies and to hire employment specialists and to have required training for them. Um, but we need a lot more really good supported employment. Um, there's too many people who are saying, yep, I tried that once and it didn't go well. <laughs> there's too many family members that are out there going, yep, we tried that and I didn't get anywhere. Um, and so I think we all need to know how to advocate for better services. Right? Employment specialists need to be supported by their employers to do really good work and to have the time that it takes because supported employment is a really powerful support for people, but it takes time. It's not fast. It's not, I need a job tomorrow. And, and lots of people want a job tomorrow for lots of reasons, <laughs> and it's not that. Um, so I think we all need to know what good supported employment is. Um, and I think, did they get in the handouts the what is and isn't supported employment that I said? You have that. So that's something that actually uh, Milton Tyree had come up with that we use at our trainings to have an idea. This is what we mean by good supported employment. This isn't what we mean by supported employment. Right? Taking someone and driving up and down Nicholasville Road here in Lexington, filling out applications everywhere you see is not supported employment. It might be a job search, and it is one method of finding a job. It does not happen to be an effective method of finding a job. And it is not an effective method of finding a job for someone with an impacted disability that's going to take some consideration to find a good job. Right? So that's why we put that on there. Of, this is not what we mean by supported employment. So if everybody understands that, then we can help have those conversations of, but this is what I'm looking for, for my brother or sister, for my son or daughter, or for case managers to talk with the employment specialist. Okay, so we're going to authorize for these hours of supported employment. They're going to go to VR. This is what I expect. And have the conversation, this is what I know about John. This is what I could see him being really good at. Right? So the employment specialist should be asking you all, whatever your roles are, but if they aren't, <laughs> offer up that information, right? If you as a parent know, I've taught him data entry skills, we've worked really hard on the computer to have this, then make sure you tell the employment specialist. And if somebody doesn't see that skill at first glance and first impression, then make sure they show them. Right? So we all work together to understand what's possible for people. Um, no, connected. So on our website, and it isn't linked here because of some other difficulties we had, on um, hdiuky.edu slash SETP, which is on in bigger print on the back of your slides, um, has that website. There's a link for families and um, job seekers. So if you click on that, there's all kinds of wonderful information. Milton's done an incredible job on that website of their stories, lots of, quite a few different stories of people who have good jobs. Um, there's a list on there if you read through it all and click the different links of if you are a family member or a friend or someone who is cares about someone who's looking for supported employment, questions for you to ask a potential provider and the answers that you want to be hearing. And I think it even lists the things you don't want to be hearing. So if you're not hearing the things that you want to hear, then have that conversation with them. Sometimes that employment specialist might need, well, you know what? Mom or the sister or the case manager says, this is what they're really looking for. And that helps them go back to their supervisor, who's taken a lot of heat for billings and time and all that to say, but they're on our back to do it this way. So how about if we try it like that? So if everybody works together. Um, so that website has all kinds of information about employment supports and other types of training opportunities and good stories and lots of resources. Um, and there is also, and we use this or recommend it to people, so we reference Mike Callahan a couple times. Um, Mark Golden Associates has a three-piece book that they have, Discovery Charting the Course to Employment that um, there's the link for ordering. You can order it online. Just Google it. They're not that expensive. If you're trying to think about what employment could possibly look like for somebody, 
because I think there's reasons why our employment rates aren't very high and why doubling our employment rate didn't exactly bump us up to numbers we're all celebrating, um, is for a lot of people it's hard to think about, right? It's that idea of thinking about people in a different way and thinking about work in a different way. And this is one resource that's really, really good to help us think about those things in different ways and to give us a framework to do so. Um, some of us are just incredibly creative and we have wonderful vision and we can see it. And some of us like structure. <laughs> And we like checklists and questions and ways to help us see things. So this can be a way to help us see other opportunities. Um, and then join other organizations. We've referenced APSI a couple of times. Um, I have my Kentucky APSI cup up here, both for water and as a prop. Um, APSI is a national, now international organization. Um, we have an active Kentucky chapter here. We were one of the first APSI chapters. Um, and their focus is employment for people with significant disabilities. That is their focus and what they do. They have all kinds of incredible webinars and publications and documents on their website. Um, they have a great conference every year. They have chapters across the country. Our state chapter puts on um, a really good conference, if I do say so myself. And I do, since I help organize it. Um, and it will be in February, so watch for that information. And they also have people on staff in the D.C. area who are paying attention to this stuff. So if you didn't know that the ABLE Act just passed the House, but you want to know those kind of things, joining APSI will give you those alerts to let you know what's coming and who you can contact and what kind of things you can say so that you're in the know of what's going on. Because quite frankly, you're all probably very busy and you're watching the clock on a Friday afternoon. And it's a whole lot easier if someone sends that information to your inbox but doesn't over inundate you with messages to your inbox rather than seeking it all out yourself. Um, TASH is another wonderful organization. Um, APSI actually spun off of TASH so many years ago. Um, and TASH focuses on a lot more issues other than just employment. But get involved and join these organizations. Get on their mailing list, get their newsletters. TASH has an incredible newsletter just doesn't even begin to phrase it. Publication journals that they put out um, that have excellent information in all realms of life for people with significant disabilities. So I think if we all learn more about it and work together, then we can, I have hopes that we can help elevate um, the employment supports that people get in our state. Because there's a lot more opportunities. And with employment first come in, there's a lot more people looking for work. That's fabulous. And we need really good ways to help people find work and have success with that. Ooh, that made me dizzy. <laughs> I don't think I knew it was going to spin like that. Do you all, <laughs> are there questions? This ends the formal presentation. We were just so thorough. That's what it is. <laughs> and it's cold and rainy and Friday. Thoughts or comments? Yeah. Uh, this might be a difficult question to answer. <laughs> and thank you for asking. <laughs> We'll give it to you. But <laughs> at what age do you recommend people start thinking about employment and working towards that goal? I mean, obviously that's a lifelong thing. <laughs> but, you know, it, a lot of professionals that work with people with disabilities are not thinking that way from the get go. So, when we say you get an OBR job specialist involved, what age? I mean, personally, I think if you wait until they're 18 or 19, you're waiting too long. Ideally, I'd like to be invited into preschools. I mean, really, so that ex that expectation is set. Because when you talk to people who do the work, they'll say it's a lot easier when the expectation has been there since they were a kid that they're going to go to work. Um, it, it should really be no different than it would be for a non-disabled child. Now, the service part does have ages because of funding streams and how different systems work. Um, VR will enter, what? Two, you can have a case two years before you exit high school. There's a community-based worst transition program that starts earlier in school. Um, schools should have transition plans. But you're right, you have to start thinking really early to make sure that employment is a part of that and that it gets as a goal and then it stays as one. Um, so I'd want to bring them in as early as you can. I, 
schools all function as that school functions. I think some are really good about inviting folks from VR and other agencies in before students exit high school, and, and some don't do that as much. I, I don't know why, and um, the person in the room I would have pointed to seemed to have skipped out briefly. Um, but I, I would want it on the table as early as possible, it, because the sooner that's an expectation in someone's life, the easier it's going to be. The families that I know in Kentucky for whom employment has always been an expectation, regardless of the disability of, of their child, those folks are employed, are employed very gainfully. I mean, it, it makes sense that it's easier to figure out employment for someone coming out of high school who's always had this expectation than for someone who's 45 and never had the expectation and has been in a day program for 25 years. Um, it's possible for both. And, and it does happen for both, mm -hmm. very successfully. Well, and I'm sorry, I'm just brainstorming. Um, but are high school resource teachers trained to have that expectation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a high school resource teacher, so I don't know. Right. But in your um, experience, um, from what I hear, it sounds like maybe no. Or if I provide training, I talk a lot, and I like to think that people that come to my trainings eat up every word that I say and remember it, and then go forth and do good things. And in the reality, that is not the case. <laughs> Much yeah, to a blow to our it's egos. Not really, it's um, not really so whether they have that training or whether they just get so bogged down in the day to day, I don't know. For our school people, um, but it doesn't. It isn't as high a priority in every school as I'd like to see it. That's or very it true. Be. And and the sad thing is that statistics tell us if a child works while they're in high school, they're going to work after high school. So I and mean, if we're ever going to have the kind of impact on employment for people with disabilities we need to have. We need to start earlier and earlier. Um, I believe that in most schools the plan is for employment services to start around 16, I believe. Very often they don't get around to it until much later. It ought to be, is it 14 now? Uh, very often they don't get, seem to get around to it until later, if at all. Uh, and I think that's something that's got to change. And I, I believe there's, in all honesty, I believe that there's a desire for that to change in most places. The WEO Act is mandated. Mm -hmm. It is mandated. Yeah. But then again, it, it we have other mandates too. Well, <laughs> but another aspect of it too is like, even if you start to think about employment, we'll say at 14, unless the soft skills and other aspects mm -hmm. that are critical to employment are put into place first and properly developed, it doesn't matter if you start working on them at 14. They're, the kids aren't going to get there in time for employment to genuinely happen. Those aspects to a um, IEP have to be in place extremely early as be one of the main focuses of, like, the main focus of non-academics. You know, yeah. it has to be included simply because in the end, a school functions to provide training for a kid to be able to work and function in daily life when they leave. So it's not like the school can say, well, it's not academic, we don't do that. Yeah, that's one of the things that has to be in place in order for the transition plan to actually have a shot of working. Yeah, and I think the example that Katie gave is, is, is pretty relevant here too. Oftentimes the work experiences that are provided tend to leave the person associating work with something that's negative because the work experiences tend not to be personalized to that person. They tend to be what's available for everyone. So. I'm a parent, so I'm just wondering what, what your all's experience has been based on what I've seen. Not, so I realize it's not really a question. I'm just trying to... <coughs> that's a great question. Have high expectations. And, and individualizing is critical because it's going to look different. You're looking for different things for each person. So the idea of just having the five places that the school job coach knows about and rotating people through it, you might get lucky and somebody likes what they do, but you might not. And then you're going to see more behaviors or problems and then people learn that this, either they learn they don't want to go to work or other people learn that they can't work. 
And not being able to work in an entry level service sector job is not at all the same as not being able to work. Honestly, Dr. Kleiner would know better than I do, but all of our Dr. Lobianco, but all the post school outcomes, Tracy, show that students also go involved in activities. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are lots of things that mm -hmm. help people to develop, you know, whether it's relationships or skills or get to know themselves. Mm -hmm. That they could lead to yeah. increased possibilities of employment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that they yeah. have those, those life experiences when they are younger. Yeah. When Same experiences. Yeah. All, all those students. Are good. I'm just not uh -huh. sure that. But I guess what I'm asking, not really asking. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what's the buy-in with schools? And I'm just wondering if my experience is, can that be generalized, or am I missing? From what I've heard, some schools are really good, some are horrific. <laughs> to be quite honest, there's no other way to put it. Like, I moved down to Alabama, and the local school there is beyond terrible. <laughs> but, um, and that's not even, like, that's an understatement. Um, but a lot of others in the same area are very good. So, it, it's sort of hit and miss. We can talk more about it. The, I think that's where there's a kind of shift in the education system that's kind of happening to be more inclusive. But I think on the long run, we also have to be able to look at the education system and what are those expectations? Because if a child is placed in the special education classes, those expectations are very different than what the expectations are in the mainstream class. And the outcomes are two completely different things. So if a child has been in classes for 21 years and then they're not going to graduate with an actual diploma, then they're not going to have that expectation or that self-worth to say, I want to be able to work and I want to be able to, you know, function. And it goes back to what she was also saying too, that, you know, research shows that, you know, um, kids and, and adults who are active in, you know, leisure activities and have an active social life, you know, are often much more satisfied in life and have the skills to become um, employed in, an, in a job where they're not underemployed, that they are being able to do what they want to do with their lives. And I think it's important to keep the, just that presumption of employability, that mm -hmm. whether you graduate with a diploma or an alternate diploma, that there are options after high school. There's options for employment, there's options for education. You can be a part of a CTP program at a university without a high school diploma. And you know the SHEP program can support students who have alternate diplomas and going to college and getting some education that can offer them the hope of a better job when they finish <coughs> that. that the expectations are important, but lots of things can be figured out when people really thoughtfully think about it. I think with the 2004 regulation, the idea regulations, that there's dialogue in the IEP, but until you start actually adding outcomes to that, because the, basically what schools are doing now is they're making sure that the appropriate language is a part of the the, the child or the use um, plan, <clears throat> they, when, you, when you have no responsibility for the actual outcome of those things, then you just kind of say, well, we'll just take care of it until time runs out. Yeah. And you see that in adult services yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 The, the discussion, but not the outcome. No outcome. But with the, the WOA, W-O-A, -O yeah. 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 um, where they're pulling that 15% and putting mm -hmm. that towards the schools, maybe that'll cause there to be some more crossover and overlap and dialogue. That's the intent. Yeah, uh, and I think that with, and again, with adult services, what we're doing is that now we have expectations of results. <laughs> and uh, of, of excellence and, and ex folks actually doing the things that are in their plan. Uh, and, and the more we can transition to that kind of reality, by clearly the better off we are. So. And can we just say that your brother-in-law did not get his job by knowing anybody? No, he didn't. <laughs> he, 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 he wasn't he hired before your wife was hired? He was. He was. Yeah. He, he, was so and he was hired before his sister, mm -hmm. who's yeah. married to Jeff. Yeah. So 
a conversation about who you know. <laughs> that was not that, the case in That was not what happened there. Uh, but and, and I have to tell you that we just moved to offices, and David had been our, our receptionist for about 10 years in the morning. And guess what? In our new setup, we really don't need a receptionist. It's just as Katie was talking about, jobs change. So as a group, we got together and we started thinking about, you know, what can David do? that will free other folks up to do other things. And he ha now has an entirely new list of, of, of job duties that he's learning to do and doing quite well with that take the heat off of many other folks in the office. So again, you always have to, to be conscious to the need for job development as things move forward, as things do change. And I must say, there was never any thought about eliminating his job, not for the first second. And I don't think that had anything to do with the fact that I worked there or Susan works there. Uh, I mean, that you know, because there are tasks that need to be done that he can do that free up a significant amount of time for other people. So that's the way to look at it. Do folk rehab counselors have to go to schools? Question. Wrong people to be asked. I would like to answer that question. <laughs> no, don't answer that question. That's I, I think there is an expectation oh. with WIOA that that that, that, that there that that happened, but I don't know that they figured out exactly how that can happen. Or did it have a, to be at the school, or if it could be elsewhere? School actually has to extend the invitation. Yeah, I don't right. know that a counselor can force their way into a school. Right. Well, I know that the... Oh, well, I know they can't do that. Well, I know, I know <laughs> but that they OBR aren't mandated to be there. now have a counselor um, specifically right. for the transition age. Um, and Some that do. That's, I don't do, know that all, all do. But yeah. They're it, moving I think toward it's that. moving towards that way, has been my understanding. Well, I, I don't think they're wired to as in like no. they'll lose their jobs if they don't, in my opinion, unless they're like in the hospital, they should. Um, because the OBR office where I live now, I think a bomb needs to go off on it. Um, <laughs> one of the things that makes me feel that way, of course, is that all of the uh, we are counselors, essentially, they're invited to oh, no, um, IEP uh, meetings with the kids and transition meetings and all of that. <laughs> of course, they don't ever show up, um, even though they were expected to. And the kid is actually on you know, the OBR's case rules because they're that old, old enough for it. And so it's not mandated where they'll lose their job if they don't show up. It should be. I think it goes back to kind of good old-fashioned having good relationships and communication and in some places have better relationships than others and I don't know if some have bad relationships or some just haven't created those um, you know but again us working together whether it's the VR counselor in the school system or the VR counselor in the case manager I mean I know the the VR system and the waiver system are two very different systems that didn't have a lot to do with each other for a long time and people have worked really hard to get to know each other and to understand the language and to have relationships and you know APSI has spent a lot of time getting VR counselors and employment specialists and case managers together so that they understand each other's roles and what goes on and I think the same kind of thing probably needs to happen with the school system too if we can get um, and, and that those is, people are, that but beginning that to helps tremendously when they just yeah. get to know each other and understand you're, you're not trying to make my job harder. I, I think we need to keep getting that message out too. Any other questions? Five minutes. How do you think employment firms will actually look at the state considering the whole money issue with it? Well, I think that if we're able uh, to make the kind of economic arguments of, that are out there, I think that we stand a really good chance of, of getting something meaningful in place. Because again, uh, effective employment services will provide a net return to society. And there's no question. Hmm? When it comes to politicians, that doesn't always mean much because you're like, well, we have no money now. Yeah. All we need is a crack in the door. <laughs> yeah. All we need is a crack in the door, and then we'll start pushing and see what happens. Carol. Jeff, in the beginning of your presentation, mm -hmm. you showed a slide very, very early on about the 
potential I waivers. Mm -hmm. Can That's you say yeah. a little bit more about that? That's yeah, it's actually a change uh, in, in the rules from CMS uh, that allow uh, waiver programs to work across disability groups. See, in the past, waivers had to be specific to a disability. So now what we do have the ability to do is to have a service-only waiver. So we could establish an employment services I waiver that would include employment services, uh, benefits analyses, and things of that nature to help folks go to work. So instead of a waiver that is based, like the acquired brain injury waiver mm -hmm. from the SCL, which is based upon a population, here's all the services, this would be a waiver that was based upon the service. Across and, all and disabilities. Then, and then anybody who met the yes. criteria. Yes, anybody that meets the criteria. And the key is we have to develop the criteria in a fashion that assures that it's not extended beyond that population that actually needs the service. Are we considering? Oh, yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's a tough sell right now, clearly. I mean, a lot has been going on with Medicaid, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, between managed care and expanded Medicaid and everything else that's been happening, they have been pretty busy. Um, and, you know, when you talk about I waivers, the other possibility is that we could end up with a supported employment I waiver through managed care, which would be an entirely different animal that I'm not sure exactly how we would manage. So, well, I don't necessarily want it either. So there are all kinds of different possibilities out there. And the thing we need to do is make sure that we do this very thoughtfully uh, and garner the kind of support that we need to be successful with it in the long term. Because the last thing we want to do is to attempt to do something that we're ill-prepared to do and fail. Other states that have tried an I waiver in supported employment? Delaware uh, has just gotten approval for an employment I waiver, uh, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Their governor was one of the biggest advocates for employment services for people with disabilities in the country. So we're watching what's going on very closely, what's going on in Delaware, uh, and trying to model. I actually have a copy of their, I've had a copy of their waiver since it was submitted, uh, and, and we're, we're looking very carefully at that. Uh, again, it, it has to be done quite Thoughtfully. It's not something that can can be done um, in a haphazard fashion. What department would be open? Well, all waivers are run through Medicaid services. They would simply contract out with someone else, and whom they would contract out with would be their choice. Although it would make a lot of sense for it to be OVR. <laughs> Is there any guess on a time frame for that? Oh, no. Ten years tomorrow. <laughs> 40 years. Ten, ten years, they'll probably be doing something else. So I would say ten years Shoot is way 10, too far. And you might be okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, might be, you might be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I, I think that uh, you know we we have some changes likely coming here in Kentucky in the next few years, and, and I think that we have to work through those changes and, and see. But clearly, clearly, I think that we'll we'll have an argument ready uh, within the next year to year and a half. Whether we have the opportunity to make that argument yet remains to be seen. And there are a large number of people who receive support employment services that do not have a waiver. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's the, the key reason. The lack for it. of long term support funds, mm -hmm. it makes it difficult, and agencies have to have other ways then to pay for to provide that support. Um, but it certainly isn't out of the question for other question. people. You're working with, with families, if the family doesn't have waiver services, how, how do they do that? That that's the reason for doing the I waiver because it would expand services beyond the existing waiver. There has been some state general fund dollars that have been able to pay for it. Some agencies have private donations. There's a couple counties that have county tax dollars that are allocated to an agency to provide that. It, it, it's really individual up to where you happen to be um, and what agency. Some subsidize it by other parts of the organization. Some send a postcard once a year that say, call me if you need me. I mean, there's different ways. <laughs> yeah, there's a wide variety, but Kay makes a good point. There are, state, there are some state general funds that are available, and the comp cares can make application for those funds for employment if they choose to do so. Uh, I know of one large comp care that has requested a lot of assistance with employment, and they've received some. Uh, so again, it, it's a matter of, you know, the entire system is changing 
right now, and, and it's a matter of the comp care systems identifying the need and, and requesting assistance now. So the IV room would be for long-term support or would it be for the entire process? It would be for the entire process if the use of, uh, of VR funding has already been expended. You have to start with VR yeah. because by law you have to start with rehab and act funding. It medicates the payer of last resort. If rehab funding has been used, then it's available through the waiver. All aspects are available through the waiver. So essentially, someone would come in, they would start getting supporting employment, but while they're doing that, they would also apply for this, considering it takes 50 eons, it seems like, for these sorts of things, like waivers to actually go through the paperwork and all of that. Or like that part of it would happen simultaneously, so that way after 90, it was it 120. I forgot how many months VR pays, but then once if someone already VR has the waiver, paid. once VR has paid that fund, then they could yeah. switch over to those. If they don't have a waiver yet, that would be another conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah. But we are now at 302. So can we finish that answer? Yeah. In just a minute. Uh, it's almost time's up, so you need to finalize else? anything you need to say. I'm Tom Keeper. That's what I just said. Oh, you did? I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen. I just this is why you direct all of your school it. questions to her. Yeah, she right. has returned to the room. Now I'll yes. put her on the spot. Give her your school questions. I'll stick around. Thank you all very much. Enjoy your weekends. I think Mita needs a room. She does. Oh, please fill out your evaluation. I shouldn't tell you to say great things, but be honest, and there's a box by the exit door for them.